Well, finally, good evening, University Church of Christ family. It is October the 27th, 2021, uh, our midweek Bible study here live on Facebook. Uh, I was trying to do something different to put a PowerPoint and we'll have to work on that again uh, on next week. Of course, I, I need Brother Rick Winston, I guess, to kind of walk me through. Uh, but we are thankful to God that you have joined us for our live Bible study here on Wednesday night, October 27th. Again, I apologize for not being able to get on right at 7 o'clock. However, we were trying some different things, some new things, uh, so that you can have access to PowerPoint and to be able to see the notes and the scriptures and uh, we weren't able to get that done this evening, so we will try next time. Uh, but in order to get as quickly to our lesson on tonight, uh, again, I'm Terrence McLean, Minister of the University Church of Christ here in Cleveland, Ohio. On behalf of the elders, Brother Frank Barnes, Brother Donald Nelson, Brother Greg Shields and their families, on behalf of our deacons, Brother Freddie Gibson and uh, Brother Anthony Slade and their families, as well as all of the marvelous members of the University Church of Christ. We are thankful that you have joined us. Uh, it is good to see that my sister-in-law, Sister Bonnie Wilson, has joined us, and it's just always good to see her name. Uh, it's good to be with you tonight. Sister Linda McLean's birthday was today. She is sitting across from me, just beaming from ear to ear. Uh, God has blessed all of us with her presence. I won't say how old she is because my mama raised me better than that, uh, but she is God's <laughs> child, and we are just thankful to God that she's celebrating a new year, a birthday today. Uh, some announcements and prayer requests. The final arrangements for Brother Floyd Patterson are as follows. Family visitation will be on Friday, October 29th at 4 o'clock p.m. at the Calhoun Funeral Home located at 17010 Lakeshore Boulevard in Cleveland. Uh, the funeral service will be at the Church of Christ at the Boulevard there on St. Clair, Saturday, October 30th. The wake will be at 10 o'clock a.m. and the funeral will be at 10.45 a.m. Uh, Sister Emma Brown requests prayer for Sister Cornelia Swing. Sister Ruth Wade requests prayer for her husband and our brother William Wade, who is having some tests done on November 5th. Uh, Sister Gina Slade reports that her mother, Laura Brown's surgery went well and wants us to continue to keep her in our prayers for a speedy recovery. Uh, we want to continue to pray for all of the previous prayer requests as well as those who have lost loved ones that we have been praying for that God will comfort them. In relation to our beloved brother Floyd Patterson, of course, uh, we are just so thankful to God for brother Patterson that worships with us. Uh, and we just pray that you will continue to bless both of the brother Pattersons that wor worship with us. Uh, at the University Church of Christ and their families, Brother Arnold and, of course, Brother James. Uh, our, our fifth Sunday offering will be on this coming Sunday, October 31st. And then, of course, the virtual classes for the men and women will be every third and fourth Sunday. The sisters, third Sunday, 5 o'clock p.m. The men at 4 o'clock, on the fourth Sunday at 5 o'clock p.m., and you know how to have access to that. If you don't, just call the church office and we'll be glad to give you that information. Uh, continue to pray for all of our sick and shut-in brothers and sisters, their families, administering to the health and care of our loved ones. We want to pray for them. Uh, continue to pray for our leadership, our elders and deacons and their families, Sister McLean and I, I as the evangelists and our families. Continue to pray for the body of Christ uh, around the greater Cleveland area, Northeast Ohio, the state of Ohio, around the country, and around the world. But we're thankful to God again. Uh, as I said, Sister McLean had a birthday today. Thank God for that. But we were in 
form that Sister Hicks, uh, our beloved Sister Hicks, had her 94th birthday on this past Saturday, and we are certainly thankful to God uh, that she has uh, come to 94 years young, and we just pray that God will continue to bless and keep her uh, in his loving care. Uh, if you will, bow with me as we briefly go to God in prayer, and then we'll go right into our lesson tonight. Uh, gracious and eternal Father, we thank you for this day and for the many blessings of life that you've given us. We know that it's in you that we move and live and have our very being. And we just ask you, Father, to accept our gratitude. We, we know that it's only because of your grace and mercy that we are among the land of the living. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you now for an opportunity to teach your word. I humble myself before you. I hide in the shadow of the cross. Seek only your glory. Seek only to lift up Jesus so that all might be drawn to him. Seek to edify the saints of God. And Father, use me as your mouthpiece that your word will go forth and touch the hearts of those who have not yet obeyed the gospel. Convict them of their need of the salvation that's in Christ and in him alone. Mm -hmm. And Father, our prayer is that we will be careful to always give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. Thank you for Jesus, your Son, our Savior, our Lord. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, the down payment of heaven. Thank you for your word, a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our pathway. Thank you for the church, the bride, and the body of Christ. Just thank you so much. You've certainly been better to us than we've been to ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen. 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 All right. We're going to pick up at uh, Hebrews chapter chapter 5. And I am going to be uh, using the American Standard Bible. And tonight, as we go into the lesson, I'm going to be trying to make up for some some lost time due to these technical issues. But as we look at Hebrews chapter 5, it's talking about Jesus as the high priest of, of compassion. In verses 1 through 6, in particular, we are reminded, and we ended the fourth chapter talking about the high priest under the old covenant and how they had to re be replaced over and over again. But here in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1, it says, For every high priest being taken from men, among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. We were introduced to the subject of Israel's high priest in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, again in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, and then Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. But at this point in our study, the author of Hebrews discusses the office of high priest in more detail, and he makes the comparison with Jesus. God gave the priesthood for the benefit of of mankind, of Israel in the Old Testament, and God gave his son Jesus too for the benefit not only of Israel, but of all mankind under the new covenant. To be a high priest, or even a priest in general, in the Old Testament, one had to be of the seed of Abraham, or the Aaron rather, the seed of Aaron. Exodus chapter 29 and verse 9. The recognized high priest was one who served as judge among the people regarding spiritual matters. Uh, if you have a Bible, I want you to turn there to Deuteronomy chapter 17 just to show you the importance of this high priest in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 17, beginning at verse number 8, reading through verse 12. If any case is too difficult for you to decide between one kind of homicide or another, 
between one kind of lawsuit or another and between one kind of assault or another being cases of dispute in your courts, then you shall arise and go to the place which the Lord your God chooses. So you shall come to the Levitical priest or the judge who is in office in those days, and you shall inquire of them, and they will declare to you the verdict in the case. And you shall do according to the terms of the verdict which they declare to you from that place which the Lord chooses. And you shall be careful to observe according to all that they teach you, according to the terms of the law which they teach you, and according to the verdict which they tell you, you shall do. You shall not turn aside from the word which they declare to you to the right or the left. And the man who acts presumptuously by not listening to the priest who stands there to serve the Lord your God, nor to the judge, that man shall die. Thus you shall purge the evil from, from Israel. And I've read that to you from the New American Standard Bible because of how contemporary that version of the Bible is. As you can see, this, this high priest had the authority to enter into the most holy place once a year. It's called the Day of Atonement. And he made atonement for his sins as well as the sins of the people. And this can be found in Leviticus chapter 16. So the high priest offered sacrifices of blood along with wine, oil, and grain that man's sins would be expiated. In particular, the children of Israel, God's chosen people at this time. But as I noted earlier, Jesus is the New Testament Christian's high priest. Mm -hmm. He has been appointed by God to serve mankind by offering himself as a human sacrifice for the sins of mankind. So Jesus not only offers the sacrifice, Jesus himself is the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And later we shall discuss the comparison between the old priest and law and the tabernacle with the New Testament priesthood, law, and tabernacle. Because under the Old Testament, under the old covenant, under the old law, all that was done was but a shadow or a copy of the real thing that was to come. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. No, Coke is not the real thing. Jesus is the real thing. And so when you go back to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 2 and 3 reads this way. Who can bear gently with the ignorant and erring for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity? And by reason thereof is bound as for the people so also for himself to offer for sins. Now let us first identify the ignorant and erring. There are times in man's life or woman's life that we sin in ignorance of God's laws. Now many people use euphemisms and steal from their employers in all good conscience because their conscience has not been trained to differentiate between truth and error, between right and wrong, between good and bad. Numbers 15, verse 22, and the verses following will help you to get a better handle on, on this idea that our consciences need to be trained. We often hear people say, let your conscience be your guide. Mm -hmm. But if your conscience has not been trained by the word of God, then your conscience may lead you astray, right. even though your conscience is your guide. Mm -hmm. Now, there's still others who know God's laws, yet they give in to the lust of the flesh. Mm -hmm. Look at Romans chapter 7. Verse 14, 
Romans chapter 7, verse number 14. Now remember, there are those whose conscience has not been trained to differentiate between truth and error, right and wrong, good and evil, but then there are others who know God's laws, yet they give in to the lust of, of the flesh. And so this is the way Paul puts it in Romans chapter 7, verse 14. Romans chapter 7, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. I'm going to get to verse 20, but I want to read the verses in between now that I'm here. Verse 15, for that which I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not wish to do, I agree with the law, confessing that it, being the law, is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which indwells me. For I know, verse 18, I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh for the wishing is present with me or in me but the doing of the good is not for the good that i wish i do not do but i practice the very evil that i do not wish verse 20 but if i am doing the very thing i do not wish i am no longer the one doing it but sin which dwells in me so there are those whose conscience has not been trained to differentiate between truth and error, good and bad, right and wrong. Then there's still others who know God's laws, yet they give in to the lust of the flesh. Whatever the case might be, what, whatever state you might be in as you watch this, whether you're watching it live on Facebook, watching it later on Facebook, or watching it up on YouTube, or if I haven't messed it up too much tonight, or if you're on the teleconference call, whatever the case may be, when a man sins, when a woman sins, when a boy or girl sins, they are separating themselves from Jehovah God. Listen, in our society, we minimize sin, and we do have a lot of euphemisms to make it sound a little better, a little bit more palatable, uh, things are a little more accepted in our culture now that weren't accepted even when I was growing up. But listen to what the Word of God says. God said to Israel of, his old, of old, his chosen people, in Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save. Neither is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you so that he does not. Here, in 1 John chapter 1 in, in the New Testament, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. Again, this is the New American Standard Bible. It says, and this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Wow. You see, it's very important that you understand that being ignorant of God's word, not knowing, and, and all the word ignorant means is just not knowing whether 
you have never been taught or you have forgotten what you have been taught. Uh, we were reminded in earlier chapters of Hebrews that we, we should take heed to what we have heard unless we let it slip and we drift away from our relationship with God. So he identifies the ignorant and erring, and then he goes on and tells us that Jesus bears gently. The Greek word there means to moderate one's passions, to be gentle, to be compassionate. That's from Moulton's Greek lexicon, page 268. W.E. Vine's word studies of the New Testament says it means to treat with mildness or moderation, to bear gently with. The idea is that of not being unduly disturbed by the faults and ignorance of others, or rather perhaps a feeling in some measure in contrast to the full feeling with expressed in the verb some patheo in 415, Hebrews 415, with reference to Christ as the high priest. What it says is that though God has passionate hatred for sin, Romans 12 and verse 9, God is forbearing and long-suffering with sinful man because he loves us. Look at 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse, verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9. The Bible says, says this. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Now I want that to sink in. Again, that's the New American Standard Bible. The King James Version puts it this way. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Listen, I, I want to make this as clear as I can. God is not sitting up in heaven rooting for people to be lost. He's not sitting up in heaven just waiting to catch sinners in sin so he can zap them and send them off the hill. He is long-suffering. He doesn't want anybody to perish. That includes you. Mm -hmm. That includes me. And you know what it says in 1 John 4 verse 10, and this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In other words, John said, man wasn't looking for God. Man was not declaring his allegiance for God. Man was not loving God before Jesus came here. God came looking for us. God came looking for us. Why? Because he, he loves us. But there will come a day when his gentle long-suffering and patience will end against sinful man. The day's coming. Second, Thess Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 7 down to verse number 9, about verse 9, it says, and to you who are troubled, this is the King James Version, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his 
mighty angels and flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ. But right now, God is long-suffering, mm -hmm. gentle, and patient with all of mankind. See, man needs to understand that the reason God has not destroyed the world yet is not because we are all that in a bag of chips. It's not because we got it all together. It is because he wants as many people saved as possible. And that only comes through those of us who are Christians and gospel preachers preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to a world that is lost in sin. While in the flesh, Jesus suffered all things that we do. He was tempted. He had experienced pain. He got hungry. He got tired. Mm -hmm. But he never sinned. Now, we read that in Hebrews 4, verse 15. So Jesus understands firsthand what it means to be tempted to sin. And because he knows what it means to be tempted to sin... He can go before God the Father as our mediator, as our high priest, and he can be long-suffering and forbearing. We've already said or studied in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 18 that he has provided an avenue of escape, an avenue of rescue. Mm -hmm. We saw in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 that he always provides us help in the nick of time, in our time of need. How did he do it? He laid down his life as a living sacrifice for our sins. He pleads with us to take advantage of his sacrifice. What defined the Lord's character? Was it not his words and his actions? Didn't he say on one occasion, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father also in John chapter 14? Mm -hmm. When Philip said, show us the Father, <laughs> Jesus said, when you see me, you've seen the Father also. Because I and the Father are, are one. Mm -hmm. If he and the Father are one, that means that not only is God the Son long-suffering, God the Father is long-suffering. And then when we look at verse 4 and 6, it says that no man taketh the honor unto himself, but when he is called of God, even as was Aaron, so Christ also glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that spake unto him, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, if you are highlighting in your Bible, I want you to underline or highlight the fact that he is a priest forever. Forever. You see, in the Old Testament, the high priest died. And so they had to raise up another person to be the high priest. But under the New Testament, under the New Covenant, now we have a high priest who will never die. Revelation chapter 2, or in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus said, I am he who was dead, but behold now, I am alive for forevermore. So since he is alive forevermore, and since he will live on forever, he is a high priest forever. But notice it does not say after the order of Aaron says, after the order of Melchizedek. 
To be qualified to serve as high priest under the Old Testament, a man had to meet the qualifications that I mentioned before. They had to be a part of the seed of Aaron. But God made a sovereign decision in this matter as he did in calling Jesus Christ his son to serve in this capacity. It was fitting or suitable for our just God to make a sovereign decision to send his son to the earth to suffer through temptation that he might serve as a merciful and understanding high priest. We studied that in Hebrews 2 verse 10. And then again in Hebrews 2, verse 14 through 18. You see, some of the Hebrew Christians who were being tempted to go back to the Levitical priesthood may object to Christ serving as a high priest because he was not of the seed of Aaron. And to answer this objection, the author of Hebrews quotes from two passages of Scripture. He quotes from Psalms chapter 2, and verse 7, and then Psalms chapter 110 and verse 4. That Psalm chapter 2 and verse 7, and then Psalm 110 verse 4. First, Psalms 2 and verse 7 says this, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. The Apostle Paul Later in Acts chapter 13, or earlier in Acts chapter 13, 33, he had quoted from Psalm 22 uh, two and verse 7 in his sermon. The reference is used in relation to Jesus being raised from the dead to complete the promise of salvation to man that God has given. As it was God's sovereign choice to use the seed of Aaron under the Old Testament to serve as high priest, even so it is God's sovereign choice to use Jesus as a living sacrifice to serve as mankind's high priest that all may obtain eternal salvation. Secondly, the author of Hebrews justifies God's choice of Jesus as a high priest, even though he is not of the seed of Aaron, by quoting from Psalm 110 and verse 4. And that psalm says, Jehovah has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Again, the verse indicates that Jesus would serve as high priest according to God's choice. And this was God's way to save man from the consequences of their sins, the consequences of our sins. More will be said of Melchizedek, who was both priest and a king, when we get to chapter 7. So what, what the Hebrew writer does, he differentiates Jesus, our Savior and our Lord, from the high priest of the Old Testament, who was not both the priest and king. And when it talks about later in, in, in Hebrews 7, about Jesus being the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, he goes on and talks about the fact we don't know where Melchizedek came from, who his mother and father were. All we know is he showed up, he did what God told him to do, and then he left the scene. And so it compares Jesus, that Jesus did not have a, a human origin. And Jesus is not just a priest, but he is priest and, and king. So, so now verse 7 through 10 of Hebrews chapter 5 tell us that Jesus is qualified because of his suffering. Verse 7 and 8 says this, Who in the days of his flesh, having offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, under him that was able to save him from death, and having been heard for his godly fear, though he was a son, yet learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Although he were a son, Jesus still had to suffer. 
See, the subject here is not Melchizedek. It's Jesus. These verses illustrate the fact that Jesus was and is a qualified high priest, not only because God, through his sovereignty, chose him, but because he has compassion on those whom he is making the sacrifice for. We read that in verse 2 of Hebrews 5. Jesus is the loving shepherd, according to the Gospel of John and the 10th chapter. Jesus was not only tempted to sin like as we are, Hebrews 4.15, but he too experienced the pain of anxiety and anguish. Who can forget the prayer of great anguish while Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane? When you get a chance, look at Luke chapter 22, verses 40 through 44. It talks about Jesus was in such agony that he sweated great drops of blood. And doctors have a, a medical term for this where it is possible that one can be under such stress that the blood corpuscles will burst and mingled with the sweat that is coming out of the pores would be we would be blood and this was the anxiety and the anguish that jesus was going through as he was approaching the cross the cross of calvary and and he had asked his father if if it is your will let this cup pass from me Ask him that three times, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be, be done. Mm -hmm. And the text there says that God did not remove the trial of the cross, but God did send angels to comfort him. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we, we, we just kind of run over that, that part. Here is one of his created beings because he was a part of Elohim in the beginning who created the heavens and the earth and also created everything else. So here is this created being that he created being dispatched by his father to come to earth and comfort him. God's sovereign choice of high priest was and still is Jesus. However, this did not make Jesus an effective high priest. Jesus was to be made perfect like as we are to be made. Through the process of time, there will come trials that mold a man or a woman of God to perfection. They're called fiery trials in James chapter 1. Jesus was no different in this respect. Remember the Hebrew writer had said in Hebrews 2 and verse 10, for it became him for whom are all things and through whom are all things and bringing many sons unto glory to make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Part of this perfection was that Jesus was to learn obedience by the things which he suffered. Listen, we know that Jesus was not chastised for disobedience to perfection, but was chastised through mental and physical language to achieve perfection. Because even when Jesus walked this earth, Jesus said, I do always those things that please my heavenly father. The state of perfection was identified in our Hebrew chapter 2 study as teleo, to make perfect, complete, accomplish, to attain perfection, come to the end of one's labors, to reach maturity. That which made Jesus perfect, complete, or accomplished was his suffering. That he might serve as a merciful 
and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. That word succor means to come to the aid of. Jesus suffered and died on the cross for our sins, but he also suffered so that he could continue to make intercession on our behalf before the throne of God. And when he does so, he is doing so as one who became one of us. He didn't have to. Remember, he took off his glory and came to this earth and lived as a man because no one else could save us. So now we see the completely qualified Jesus as our high priest. He gained the office of high priest by the sovereign choice of God, and he is qualified to serve in such a compassionate position due to becoming perfect. He's completely understanding of the, the anxiety, the pain, and the anguish and the temptation of man because he's gone through it himself. And then in verses 9 and 10, and having been made perfect, he became unto all them that obey him the author of eternal salvation. Named of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Again, Jesus became complete in relation to his office of high priest. He suffered the same things that we do, and thereby he is able to have mercy and to bear gently with sinful man. Mm -hmm. We just read in Hebrews 5.2. Mercy. He is a, have you ever met a person, a human being, who seemed to lack the capacity to be merciful to others? Mm -hmm. Those are some of the most miserable people to be around. But since Jesus knows what we go through, He's able to plead our case before the throne of his Father. Mercy. Mercy is the withholding of the punishment we deserve. And grace is the giving of blessings or riches we don't deserve. Those who now obey him, the author of eternal salvation, will receive the eternal rest that we talked about in our previous studies in Hebrews chapter 3 and chapter 4. Eternal salvation has been identified with God's heavenly rest in those two chapters. Those who will not experience God's rest are those who are disobedient and in a state of unbelief in relation to God's laws. We studied that in Hebrews 3 verse 18 and 19. Jesus himself had said in the Gospel of John, the third chapter, in verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath eternal life, but he that obeyeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I preached a little bit about that this Sunday, this past Lord's Day, about belief always leads to obedience. We studied it last week where, again, if I believe Jesus, I'm going to obey him. Just saying that I believe him and not obeying him does not cut it with God. The author of Hebrews is clearly telling the Hebrew Christians that they now have a high priest who completely understands their trials and therefore they must give obedience to him because he has been appointed by God to serve in this capacity. And remember again, the reason the book of Hebrews was written is because there were Hebrew Christians who were 
forsaking the assembly of themselves together. They were going back into the Levitical uh, worship because of persecution. So the Hebrew writer here in chapter 5 says, listen, don't go back to that which is temporary. Oh, I know there was a high priest back there. I know that God had selected him from the seed of Aaron. I know that he had certain obligations and responsibilities, and there were blessings that accrued to you as the children of Israel. But we have a greater high priest. Don't leave him and go back. Hmm. God's appointment of Jesus is that he is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, both king and priest. As the office of high priest was slowly developed from Hebrews chapter 2 through chapter 5, even so the concept of Jesus' association with Melchizedek will be developed over the next few chapters. That's how important it is that they needed to, they must understand that there's nobody like Jesus. There's been nobody like Jesus before him. There's been nobody like Jesus since him. And there is nobody like Jesus now who can serve as our high priest. And then when we look at verses 11 through 14, the author of the epistle or the book of Hebrews identifies the state of those he's writing to. He says in verse 11, of whom we have many things to say and hard of interpretation, seeing you have become dull of hearing. This verse always has intrigued me. 40 years. 50 years, actually. Of whom we have many things to say and hard of of interpretation. Why? Because you dull to hear. The priesthood of Jesus after the order of Melchizedek is the matter under consideration. And before going on to discuss this subject in further detail, the author of Hebrews changes gears, so to say, and identifies a problem among the Hebrew Christians. Apparently, many were willing to give up Christ for their Jewish ways due to their current persecution. When you get a chance, look at Hebrews 10.32 in the verses following, even before we get there. And so the Hebrew writer says, if that's your state of mind, then you are dull of hearing. To be dull, the Greek word is nothros, N-O-T-H-R-O-S, of hearing. It means to be slow, sluggish, indolent, and dull. Most of us who have children uh, recall that there were, at least I know, I recall there were times when, when my children said I was special. And I, it took me a while to understand that they meant I, I, I was special and that I was dull. I thought they were talking about how special I really was. Mm -hmm. But they were talking about dull of hearing. You, you don't get you slow, daddy. Sluggish. The Hebrew writer says, you Christian, you Hebrew Christians, you sluggish. And he says, it's difficult to discuss the matter of the priesthood of Jesus because he knows the information will be hard of interpretation because of their sluggish and slothful spiritual state. That word, hard of interpretation, comes from a Greek word that means difficult to be explained or hard to be understood. Often we say to each other, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? We got that from one of those those pictures, uh, those movies with, with the Chinese and the African guy. I can't remember the name of them, but, you know, he would always say to him, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Mm -hmm. What the Hebrew writer says, it's hard for you to understand the words that are coming out of my mouth because 
you're dull of hearing. So he says in verse 12, for when by reason of the time you ought to be teachers, ye have need again that someone teach you the rudiments of the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of solid food. Okay, there are a few folks who are reminding me uh, on Facebook in the comments, it's Rush Hour with Chris Tucker. Thank you. I, I just couldn't remember the names, but you all know who they are. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sincere Ray. Thank you, Bonnie. They, they want to make sure I, I, I get it right. Mm -hmm. But here, the Hebrew writer says, you ought to do something. Considering the amount of time that the Hebrews have been Christians, they ought to have been teachers rather than people who had to have the elementary principles of Christ taught to them again. Hmm. The word ought translates a Greek word that means to owe, to be indebted, to be bound or obliged by what is due or fitting or consequently necessary. Why should the Hebrews be obliged or be constrained or indebted to do a thing? Hmm. First, the Hebrews, as we, are obliged to study God's word that we may thereby come to the Father in a true hope of heaven. That's why Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by, by me. The way to the Father and a hope of heaven is through truths taught by Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And secondly, we are obliged to study God's word because there is glory that awaits those who are faithful to that word. Hebrews 2.10. Thirdly, we are obliged to study God's word because he loved us enough to send his only begotten son to die as sacrifice for our sins. Clearly the Hebrews have shown themselves to be ungrateful for the blood sacrifice of Jesus. The Hebrews were presented with truth at some point in the past and they did not give diligence. We read that in Hebrews chapter 2. The Corinthian brethren were no different. Five years passed between Paul's visit to them on his second tour of preaching and the first epistle to the brethren. And during those five years, they did not grow spiritually. And Paul warns them of the dreadful consequences of such an approach to God in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1. There are too many Christians tonight or today, whenever you're watching this, who have been Christians for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years and have not grown spiritually. Mm. For the time when you ought to be teachers, you have need that someone teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. Mm. There is a time in every Christian's life that they must move past the, the rudiments, the elementary things of the gospel message. The word that's translated rudiments, generally it's one of a series, an elementary sound of the voice, a letter, or in the order of the letters alphabetically. So the words first principles identifies the rudiments as the beginning of the alphabet, so to say. When children begin school, they attend elementary and they learn first principles of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Apparently, the author of Hebrews is referring to the gospel message as a set of rudiments, like an alphabet that goes from A to Z. And the Hebrews were stuck at A, B, C. They were stuck. And he says in verse 13, For everyone that partaketh the milk is without experience of the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food is for full-grown men, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised 
to discern good and evil. Milk is the first food for a baby, as elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ are the food for young Christians. If my knowledge of truth only extends to how one becomes a Christian, hearing the gospel message of Jesus dying for my sins, believing that message, confessing with my mouth that Jesus is the Christ, repenting of my past sinful ways and being baptized for the remission of those sins, then I am not partaking of solid food which belongs to adults. Other details of the gospel uh, of Christ. Peter had said in 1 Peter 2 verse 2, as newborn babes long for the spiritual milk which is without guile that you may grow thereby unto salvation. The illustration is one of physical and spiritual growth. And if a child is not nervous, his physical body will not develop properly and will eventually die. Likewise, when a Christian does not grow spiritually, he or she will eventually die spiritually. The Apostle Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 13, what we call uh, the chapter on love. He said, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I felt as a, felt as a child, I thought as a child. Now that I am a man, I put away childish things. Mm -hmm. The Christian who remains a child spiritually is doomed. Now, I'm not talking about the, the, the childlike trust that Jesus says we must have in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But I'm talking about we are still on milk. Hmm. Paul told the Ephesians that they were to grow into adulthood in their knowledge of the Son of God. In Ephesians 4, verse 13 through 15, that we may be no longer children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and craftiness after the wiles of error. The problem with many Christians and churches today is that there is no spiritual growth. And when there is no spiritual growth, we have Christians that are tossed around by every wind of doctrine. They believe an idea sounds good and thereby they hold to it because of ignorance. Churches are divided and lifelong friends are separated because someone is stuck in the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ. Every problem associated with the work of the church, every problem associated with our homes, every problem associated with all aspects of life can be traced back to a lack of Bible knowledge. Hmm. Those who truly desire truth will have their senses exercised to discern good and, and evil. Our senses are our faculties of the human mind. The mind must be exercised. And that comes from, from a Greek word, gymnazo. That sounds a little bit like gymnasium, doesn't it? Well, that's where we get the English word gymnasium. And it's, of course, the place where you go to exercise your body to stay fit and healthy. So it says that we ought to have our senses exercised so we are able to determine the difference between good and evil. Right and wrong, truth and error. I should study God's word. It said that word discern literally means to have a judgment or to make a decision. Put them together. I should study God's word that I am not like a child who is tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine that comes my way. Said studying is to train my mind through exhaustive exercise that I may be able to separate and make a judgment between things that are good and things that are, are evil. Mm. That's our lesson tonight. Mm. I hope it's been a blessing to you. I said tonight, some of you may be watching this later in the day or in the morning, mm -hmm. um, but it was presented at night, so that's why I say night. But whenever you're watching this, I pray that you realize Jesus is our only high priest under this new covenant. 
We're going to study about it more as we move further into the book of Hebrews. But tonight, if you're not a child of God, if Jesus is not your mediator, because there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, Jesus came and died on the cross for, for your sins was buried, rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, ascended to heaven, and he's on the right hand of God, even at this very moment, making intercession for the children of God. Those are the facts of the gospel, his death, burial, and resurrection, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 5. You have to believe those facts. Jesus said in John 8, 24, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins, and where I am... Ye cannot come. You cannot come. And then when you believe that, you've got to be willing to repent of your sins. Confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God after repentance. Repentance, Luke 13, 3 and 5. Confession with the mouth, Matthew 10, 32. And then be buried in water for the remission of sins. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We had two young men do that on this past Lord's Day morning. Others who have done it as well. Brother Samuel Pinner, Brother Carlton, Pope, Pierce Williams. So many people. Sister Carmela. Have done it this year. And of course others in past years. Do you need to obey the gospel? It's been put up in the comment section, our website, our church address, our telephone number. We'd be glad to help you in your obedience to the gospel. And if you don't live in the Cleveland area and this lesson, among others, may have touched you and you want to obey the gospel, get in touch with us and we'll be glad to put you in touch with some people of God in your area that you might obey the gospel. And for those of you who are, are children of God, and, and maybe you've strayed away for whatever reason, God the Father and God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they are, they, they're long-suffering. Mm -hmm. They are forbearing. They are merciful. God doesn't want anybody to perish, but all to come to repentance. This is your opportunity to return to the bishop of your, your soul. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us in our study. Bow with me in a word of prayer. Gracious Father, thank you for this day, for the blessings of life you've given us. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for your word. Father, I pray that I have handled it aright in this lesson, that you've gotten glory that Jesus has been lifted up so all can be drawn to him, that saints of God have truly been strengthened and built up in the most holy and precious faith, and that those who have not yet obeyed the gospel, Father, my prayer is that your Holy Spirit will take the word they've heard, convict them of the need of salvation, and that they will humble themselves before you and obey the gospel before it's everlasting and eternally too late. Watch over us as we separate from this platform. We are mindful we are never out of your presence. Be with us until the next appointed time we come together. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. For all of you Christians, remember to do something that only a Christian would do. Whether you're a Christian or not, remember God loves you. Jesus died for you. I love you. And I am your servant for Jesus sake.